Alright, hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Matt Money. So today, we're going to be going through a 13F of Bridgewater Associates. It's actually a hedge fund run in partnership with Ray Dalio and one of his partners. And if you don't know who Ray Dalio is, he's a famous author and serious hedge fund manager that a lot of you guys quote all the time. So a lot of the content creators here on YouTube quote everything that Ray Dalio talks about. He's written a lot of great books with a lot of insight and uh, he's relatively well known. At the moment he's currently worth about 19 billion dollars and his hedge fund which is Bridgewater Associates is managing currently just under 13 or 14 billion dollars. So a pretty admirable size uh, to the hedge fund and he's got a long story of a bunch of different things, but I guess most of you guys probably recognize him most by a lot of the books that he has written and a lot of the speeches that he has gave uh, to the investing community throughout time. So if you guys are interested, there's a bunch of different books that you can kind of read up on and a bunch of different videos that you can read up on. Uh, but yeah, I think to guess get right to the point, we're actually just going to jump right into uh, analyzing Bridgewater Associates. There's a lot of holdings and we'll kind of touch on that quickly when we look at the 13F. But before then, just want to give a public service announcement. Uh, me and Kyle from Passive Income Investor um, are uh, actually going to do a live stream here tomorrow on Friday. So if you haven't already subscribed to our second channel where we do a lot of our streaming, feel free to jump on over and uh, subscribe to us here at Passive Income Educator, uh, which is coinciding with our website that we have up here where we write some blog posts and we also have some minor things that you can look at. You could look at my whole portfolio if you're interested in that. I uh, actually just hit 428,000 today, which I believe is the highest that I've shared with anyone on YouTube yet. Uh, the last time I think I showed it, it was like 426,000. So uh, I believe that what it's looked like is like earlier in the week, uh, this week when it was about 408,000. Obviously we had some great days here uh, coming up uh, over the past week here, uh, ending on the 22nd tomorrow. So it could even go up a little bit tomorrow as well, but um, had a good run, made some quick changes to the portfolio, which I'll probably reserve to talking about tomorrow on the live stream. So yes, please jump on over. Uh, link will be in the description for you guys to jump to this and subscribe. We're really trying to get it to a thousand subscribers so that we can actually get it a little bit monetized. Okay, so hopping over into the Bridgewater Associates 13F. So like I kind of mentioned here, there's a pretty big chunk of change. Oh, okay, I stand corrected. So I thought the market value of Bridgewater Associates was closer to 13 billion, it's closer to 5 billion. Um, so apologies on that, but like I said, there's quite a bit of holding, so I can't fit all that or take the time to break down all of that on this particular video. So what I did is I think I took like the first 50 holdings or 30 to 50 holdings or something like that. We'll see in just a moment here. But there's a whole bunch of different ETFs in here, which I think was the most surprising. You do go all the way down and you do see some small positions in things like Tesla, Uber. Uh, we won't for unfortunately get into a lot of those things today because we cover, I would say, most of the holdings in the first like 50 um, positions. But I did just want to give you guys a brief idea as to what we're looking at here, some big changes in the portfolio in terms of selling out of positions, which I was relatively surprised about, and selling out of a lot of banks as well. So I was surprised with that, but it seems like a common theme against hedge fund managers. So not sure if they're expecting banks to continue to go down poorly in the next couple quarters as loans and assets continue to go delinquent over the next couple months if delinquency rates and, and unemployment continues to rise in the marketplace. So uh, like I mentioned, this was just over five, tr uh, sorry, five billion dollars under management for Bridgewater Associates here with the first, I don't know, 30 to 50 positions. We have about 4.98 billion. So we have the majority of it here and you can see a lot of what we're kind of looking at here uh, in these first 30 50 positions that we have that we can kind of kind of go through you can see that a lot of them um, are either in financials industrials um, there is some information technology as well that just don't yield anything but a lot of it is in etfs so in terms of the percentage of the first 50 or so positions 
we're looking at about 97% of those being in ETFs, which I thought was rather surprising. I thought that hedge fund managers were generally speaking, maybe I'm biased, investing in individual securities. Uh, and we do see a little bit of that when we hop over into the portfolio aspect of things. But I was rather surprised. Um, but pleasantly surprised, I guess, because they all do seem to have their place and a reason for being in there. Uh, there is the financials aspect of things, which we'll touch on. There's industrials, information technology, and ETFs. The portfolio yields just over 1.0%, 1.1% in terms of a dividend yield. Based on the cost, which we'll get into a little bit as well, it's close to 1.2%. So you can tell automatically that the portfolio is overall down in terms of the companies that are paying dividends. It doesn't necessarily mean that the entire portfolio is down. And that's because a lot of these positions don't seem like they pay a lot of dividends at all. Uh, there is some gold and stuff in here as well. And so we'll kind of touch on that. Uh, just based off of what we're looking at in this particular portfolio, it's about $53 million in terms of dividends. So not that much, 4.4, uh, 4.5 million a month. So nothing to scoff at, but also compared to like the Saudi Arabia fund, which is just twice the size, um, that yields a lot more of um, a monthly sort of income coming from here. And same with, say, Warren Buffett's. Uh, if you kind of look at that, I was actually going to do that as well, but I think a lot of people have covered it. But if you guys are interested in seeing Warren Buffett's 13F and exactly what he's invested in, just leave a comment in the comment section down below, and I'll be sure to, to do it. So let's just hop over into the portfolio aspect of things. And of course, I think this is a million times I've said it. If you guys are interested in getting a spreadsheet like this, there's always a link in the description for you guys. A lot of it is automated, so you can see that it kind of rolls through. You can do a lot of the forecasting. All I had to do was kind of put in the share count, the price, uh, and it pulls automatically the price that we bought it. Sorry. Uh, it, it automatically will update these sort of prices and the percentage under the ship of the company, the gains and run through the forecast table so you can come up with a good idea as to the dividends that you're expecting. And this big bump here is not fake. We will get through that um, at the very end of the video when we actually discuss what companies pay dividends when. So let's quickly look at what we're invested in. So uh, scrolling all the way to the left here, we can see there's a lot of S&P 500, uh, Vanguard Emerging Markets Fund, another S&P 500 with iShares instead of say the Spider. Uh, you can see there's a, a decent amount of gold. You can see there's a decent amount of Brazil. Um, there's a lot of bonds in here as well, 20 year treasuries. Uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting at the different amount of uh, things that are initially coming up here uh, in terms of value. You can see some of them have been invested uh, for quite some time and actually ended up uh, netting quite a bit of profit, which I thought was pretty amusing. Um, you know, in terms of just looking at what we got here, we're looking at close to $500 million in profit just from these top 12, 10 positions here, um, which is pretty interesting. One thing that I, you start to notice as you go a little bit deeper into the portfolio is these individual country indices. So the Taiwan index, South Korea index from iShares. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what country this was. Uh, another gold index here, another merging markets, uh, a JP Morgan. I don't know if this is a preferred share or, or what, uh, but I guess it's a JP Morgan emerging markets fund, um, an India fund. And JP Morgan, Bank of America, and we'll touch a little bit on that. Wells Fargo, Alibaba, Mexico, you can see some China, some China large cap, Royal Bank of Canada, Citigroup, uh, some more bond funds, TD, Bank of Nova Scotia, and Canadian Railway. And like I did mention, there is Uber, there is Tesla in the portfolio as well, but it starts getting to the point where the positions are rather small. So what I actually wanna do is just quickly, if you don't mind, grabbing the actual market value of these positions here. So we can kind of just rip it over and kind of look at how much uh, currently is in each particular position here. So we just go go to the very tippy top. Uh, we can see that the first three make up about 1.8, 1.9 billion. Uh, so the S&P 500, that ends up being about 20% of the fund right there. And oddly enough, um, what this actually is showing is they changed this amount by about 49%. So they actually used to have about $2 billion worth of the S&P 500 and they sold out of it, uh, which I thought was interesting as hell. 
Um, and same thing with a lot of these positions. So in this column K here, you're going to see the percentage at which they decreased or increased that position. And you can see that majority of these positions are actually decreases, which this goes to show you here that they used to have about another 500 million in the emerging markets index fund here. They used to have another close to 400 million here in this S&P 500 fund. Uh, they actually held their gold position, which I believe was relatively smart. And they're actually gaining money on that position as we speak. Uh, they didn't buy it at such a great price, but it is what it is and uh, looking good on that particular position. But you do see that they had a decent amount in Brazil as well, $200 million in Brazil, but they actually decreased this by about 25% uh, within the past quarter, which I thought was pretty astonishing. And so all these percentage changes are just from the fourth quarter, right? So just from, let's just say, December 31st to March 31st, sometime within there. Um, there's some bond funds where they de decrease their allocation to. They decrease their allocation to the Taiwan index by about 50%, South Korea index by about 26%. Um, not sure what country that is. Kept this gold fund the same. It's about 200 million in funds there. Uh, this emerging markets index, they decreased by 6%. 6, uh, 6%. Uh, this JP Morgan here, this emerging markets JP Morgan, they decreased by 38%. They increased the India index by about 1%, which isn't very big. But this is where it gets interesting. Here's a lot of the banks that they had, the individual securities. So a lot of these have been ETFs up to this point. And once you actually get into the individual securities, like the JP Morgans, Bank of America, as well as Fargo's of the world, they actually sold out of all of it. Um, I don't remember how much they actually had uh, in terms of all these banks, but it was a pretty significant position, hundreds of millions of dollars between all of them, and they sold. Uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Same thing with Mexico, 48% sold out. China, this ETF, 40% sold out. Another China large cap ETF, 37% sold out. Royal Bank of Canada, um, this is 1.2% sold out. And Citigroup, 100% sold out. Uh, another bond fund, 35% sold out. TD, they actually only kept TD Bank and Bank of Nova Scotia, which I thought was interesting. Um, because they're Canadian banks as opposed to, say, the U.S. banks. So that was pretty interesting. And then you also have Canadian National Railway. So they actually kept their allocation in Canada, which I thought was interesting. So they didn't really sell out of every um, – they sold out of most countries or at least decreased their exposure to most countries, a lot of the United States banks – and uh, kept their position here in Alibaba. Of course, they did sell a little bit of it, but uh, they actually kept their position in the Canadian companies rather neutral. But keep in mind that this is just the share count decreasing, right? So this isn't necessarily the value that they're sort of increasing the position by. That's actually a different tab uh, or a different column altogether within the 13F, and I don't capture it here. But what you can see is just the overall performance of this entire portfolio. Now keep in mind that this is strictly just based off of what the reported price is that they bought it, the current price today. So this doesn't include anything like the 49% of the stock that they sold for this particular fund, right? So this is just the cost basis that they have reported. And you can see they have some pretty decent gains in here. Um, and let's just roll it all up. You can see it's about half a million dollars worth of gains, and that obviously gets summed all the way down here at the bottom. So a 12.3% return. But one three thing we don't know is when they bought all these different positions here. And uh, sometimes those reported net um, prices that they have uh, can be a little bit skewed. So that's, uh, that's what I'd like to just say about that. But actually going to forecast and the dividends and where you actually start seeing some of these things come in, um, the most dividends that you can probably see coming in is from this S&P 500 fund uh, right off the bat. And like I said, this is automated, so this didn't take me hours to, to fill in, trust me. Uh, I literally just filled in this last portfolio sheet, and this was nice enough to, to fill out for me and give me approximate dates as to when they expect it. So... Uh, you could, you can see that you do get a decent amount of dividends from these first three positions, but keep in mind that these first three positions are about 40% of the remaining, uh, or 40% 40, 40 of the actual fund uh, as a whole, because they're almost about $2 billion out of this $5 billion 
dollar fund here. So out of these three, you're going to get about 31 million initially. Um, a lot of these don't actually yield anything. So this is a gold fund here. This is an emerging market that so doesn't yield anything. Um, but what you do see is some of these uh, ETFs, they only pay in December time frame, which I thought was rather interesting. Um, or they pay semi-annually. I didn't go in and check all of them, but what I did do is see when these companies pay uh, based off the sheet in the past. And so if they didn't pay a quarterly payment in the first quarter, I'm just gonna assume that they're either semi-annual or annual payments. Um, and so these could easily be split up into two uh, or just pay once in the December timeframe. So I could have done it either way, but I decided to just say, hey, if they say they're gonna pay in only December timeframe, uh, and they didn't have a first quarter payment, I'll just leave it at December, end of the year. But you can see there are some pretty decent dividend pairs here. Um, these emerging markets are, are actually pretty good as well. But, I mean, they sold out of J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, which I thought was interesting. I've been buying a lot of J.P. Morgan, and it seems like everyone's just trying to get out of U.S. banks at the moment. I don't know. If they know a lot of things that I don't, it's probably accurate. Um, maybe they're just being cautious. Maybe they're just waiting to buy back in. I'm going to continue to buy them. Uh, I don't think that this is going to be that much worse than when uh, when we were in 2008 timeframe. I've done some back studies. And yes, unemployment might be worse. But at the same time, the credit uh, and the liquidity that these banks have is about 30% more than what it was in 2008 timeframe. So I think it's going to partially offset. I do think that things are going to get a little bit better. Maybe I'm being more optimistic than I should be. Uh, and maybe I'll eat my words in a couple months. But I honestly think JP Morgan's a well-run bank. I think Wells Fargo is a well-run bank. And I think that they'll come out on top of everything. Will it be a couple months? Will it be a couple quarters? I'm sure it will be, um, but I will be continuing to buy because I'm going to hold those for the long term, and I think that they're going to be around for many years to come. Um, like I mentioned, there are some other ones that I could actually add in here as well. I think I might have actually cut this off a little bit um, in terms of the payments that are to be expected Anyway, so like I was saying that this particularly might be skewed towards the December time frame, but it could really be that some of these December pairs are semi-annual pairs. I'm not going to go in and check every single position uh, like you guys might want me to, but a lot of these that I've test, uh, seen in the past, a lot of these individual country ETFs will either pay in December time frame towards the end of the year rather than paying quarterly dividends because it's a lot harder to kind of accumulate and kind of keep track of some of these companies when they're international, especially when you're kind of sitting over here in the U.S. and you don't necessarily have that ability to quickly move things over um, multiple times a year. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of that aspect of things. Looking at this December payment, it could be spread across multiple months, but from what I saw, a lot of them were paying in December, so it could mean that they're paying in June uh, and December. It could mean they're paying in July and December. Or this could be that they don't pay a, a first quarter dividend and they pay a couple others. Who knows? Uh, they could pay three times a year. Haven't seen that before, but it is what it is. So you can see that it's a rather interesting portfolio, a little bit different than what I was expecting. Uh, curious what your guys' thoughts are. Was there any positions that you know that Ray Dalio invests in that I missed, that I didn't discuss? I did mention Uber and Tesla in these particular holdings. But if we wanted to, just really quickly... Uh, we can look specifically at the different organizations that I didn't necessarily mention. If we just scroll down just a bit, something like Home Depot, Marriott Hotels, TELUS, um, Sherman Williams Company, uh, a lot of other things. They sold out of Delta Airlines, they sold out of CSX, but they kept Canadian Railways, which I thought is interesting. Um, Snapchat, they own a little bit. Splunk, Ford Motor Company, I'm surprised they didn't sell out of all of that. Um, QSR brands, Fast, which is Fast and All. It's a company I actually talked about with JMAC last night. Um, so yeah, that that's relatively interesting. I think it's cool. Wealth Connections or Waste Connections is a good one. It's a competitor to Waste Management. But 
thanks guys if you've held on for this long to the video make sure that you watch us uh meeting me and kyle on passive income educators tomorrow night at 10 p.m we will be taking this stream over from captain ryan from independent investor he hosts his normal stream here on friday nights at 9 p.m we're going to try something a little bit different we're going to try kind of like a round robin we'll see how it goes uh give ryan a little bit of a break an opportunity to kind of collaborate with folks in the live stream instead of having to manage it uh he him and i talked i think that he enjoys kind of getting involved in the conversations and talking with folks and so I think he deserves the opportunity to, one, be part of a live stream, be part of a great community, but two, also be able to evolve himself in the chat room. Because unfortunately, when you're doing these live streams, it's nice to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, spark people's interest, have people tune into the live stream. But at the same time, you're kind of focusing only on that individual. And sometimes you're missing out on some of the great conversations and uh, opportunities to help others learn in that live chat and the right hand side so hopefully we can have that happen we'll see if it works if it doesn't hey we'll be back probably to the normal kind of way of doing things next week but if it does work hey uh, we'll continue to evolve and make sure that you guys are getting the value that you need and deserve from these sorts of videos and from these streams so anyway guys really hope this video finds you guys great hope it finds you guys well i'll talk to you guys on the next video cheers